Let's look now at intermolecular forces. These are forces that exist between atoms and molecules, and they hold molecules together. They're attractive forces due to the dispersion of the electron cloud around atoms or due to the existence of dipole moments or ions. The strongest of the intermolecular forces are ion-ion forces, and then we can have ions interacting with dipole moments and the next strongest would be dipole-dipole forces and then we have dipole induced dipole and the weakest force are called dispersion forces and another name for those are London forces. So these are listed from strongest to weakest. We'll consider each one in turn. So let's first look at ion-ion forces. Now if we look at the Coulombic force, the attraction or repulsion between charged particles, this is just equal to Coulomb's constant times the charge on particle one times the charge on particle two divided by the square of the distance between the two charges. So as the charge increases, the force increases, but as the distance increases, you're dividing by a larger number, and so the force decreases. So the closer they are together, the stronger the force, and the greater the charge, the stronger the force. So we won't be considered with calculating the actual force, but let's consider a molecular ion. So one of the simplest examples is table salt, sodium chloride. Now you saw that this exists as ions. You have a sodium plus ion and a chloride minus ion. And they are held together by the attraction of the opposite charges through the Coulombic force. And this is a strong attraction and so sodium chloride is held together very strongly and it's a solid at room temperature and pressure and if you were trying if you tried to melt sodium chloride heat it up you'd have to get to very high temperature in order to start to break apart these sodium and chlorine ions due to their strong attractions to each other so if we have a salt as we saw before and ions we have ion ion forces between atoms or molecules. Now another example, say, is sodium nitrate. Here we have ion-ion attractions, but instead of having just two atoms, we have an atom and a molecular ion. So the NO3 molecular group has a negative charge on it. The sodium has a positive charge, so we have again attractions between a positive and a negatively charged species. So sodium nitrate is held together very strongly. Okay, now let's consider ion-dipole interactions. To understand these, we need to understand what a dipole is. Now a dipole is just a separation of charge. You are familiar with a magnetic dipole. You have the north and south end of a magnet, like a bar magnet. So if you have a magnet here, have the north and the south ends. This is a magnetic dipole, a separation of the poles of the magnet, magnetic field. You can have the same thing for an electric field. So we have an electric dipole. And in this case, say we have the hydrogen fluoride molecule due to the electronegativity difference between fluorine and hydrogen, 
fluorine is very electronegative and so these two electrons that are shared between the hydrogen and fluorine to form a bond actually spend more time closer to the fluorine atom than they do the hydrogen atom. So this creates an electric dipole where the fluorine is partially negative and the hydrogen partially positive. And so it's not a complete separation of charge like in sodium chloride. A whole electron's not transferred, it's just on average these two electrons spend more time around fluorine than they do hydrogen. So we have what's called a dipole moment. And this is due to two entities of charge. So this is not a complete negative charge. This delta means partial. In calculus, you'll use it for partial derivatives. So this just means a partial negative charge and a partial positive charge. So it's not like sodium chloride where a whole electron has been transferred. It just means that the bonding electrons spend a little more time on fluorine than they do hydrogen. So we can, for a molecule, we can represent the dipole moment as a vector. And I'll redraw the hydrogen fluoride molecule. And we represent the dipole moment along the bond axis of the, between the two atoms. And we go from the positive end to the negative end and so this is a vector and the length of the vector depends on the magnitude of the charges so hydrogen fluoride has a greater magnitude of partial charges and so the vector is longer so if we had um, two atoms that were similar in electronegativity, the dipole would be lower in magnitude and we would have a shorter arrow here. And we just use this plus sign to remind us that we're starting from the plus end and going to the negative end. So this is called a bond dipole <coughs> because it lies along the bond axis. So now if we take a more complex molecule and we add up all the bond dipoles, then we can get what's referred to as the dipole moment or the result of the sum of all the bond dipoles. Well, so let's do an example to show this. Let's consider the water molecule. Now you know from valence shell electron pair repulsion theory that the water molecule is bent. So we need to know its geometry. So if we look at the electronegativity differences between the atoms, oxygen is more electronegative. And so these electrons here in the bonding orbitals will spend a little more time on oxygen than they do on hydrogens. So the hydrogens are each partially positive because they're, these bonding electrons are spending more time on oxygen than they do on the hydrogens. So we have a separation of charge and we can draw the bond dipoles. So we go from the positive to the negative end of the molecule. And I'm offsetting the blue line a little bit so that you can see it. It would actually lie along the exact bond axis. So I'm going from the positive to the negative end. So these are the two vectors. Now I can add these two vectors together to get a resultant vector. And that resultant vector is called the dipole moment. And if I add these two vectors together, I would get a resultant vector that looks like this. So this is 
called the dipole moment of the molecule and goes from the positive to the negative end of the molecule. So water has a dipole moment. Now if we looked at another molecule, say the carbon dioxide molecule, you know from last semester that this is linear. So if we looked at the electronegativity differences between the atoms, oxygen is more electronegative than carbon. So oxygen will be partially negative, carbon partially, partially positive. So we will have two bond dipoles and going from the positive end to the negative end for each bond. Now if I add these two vectors together, they're equal in magnitude and exactly opposite in direction, so they will cancel. So there's no bond or no dipole moment. In carbon dioxide, because the bond dipoles exactly cancel. So let's do one more example. Say if we look at the ammonia molecule, and remember this is trigonal pyramidal geometry, so this is like a camera tripod where the nitrogen atom is at the very top of the tripod, and the hydrogens are the feet of the tripod. So we look at electronegativity differences. The hydrogens are partially positive and the nitrogen is partially negative. So we have bond dipoles going from the partially positive to the partially negative end. And I've offset them. They would lie along the black bond line, but I've offset them so that you can see them better. Now if we add these vectors, remember this is like a pyramid where they have the base of the pyramid. So the actual dipole moment would start in the middle of the pyramid and go straight up. So this is the middle of the pyramid going straight up. And so this is the dipole moment. If we added these three bond dipole vectors, this green would be the resultant vector starting in the middle of the camera tripod and going straight up to the top toward the negative end. So nitrogen with, I mean ammonia, does have a dipole moment. If we consider one more example, say natural gas, ethane, So this is a tetrahedral geometry. And if we draw all the bond dipoles, now they're all pointing in toward the carbon atom, but we have um, these three going up and this one coming straight down. So if we actually added all of the bond dipoles, we would find that they all cancel and therefore methane does not have a permanent dipole moment. So no dipole moment because all the bond dipoles cancel each other when I add them. So you might be able to envision this. This is the green coming from the hydrogens in the middle of the pyramid and this um, bond dipole coming straight down and these two would cancel each other because they're pointing in opposite directions.
So let's consider ion dipole forces. Say if you have an ion, say like the sodium atom, when it's dissolved in water, it's surrounded by a sphere of water atoms. And so you have the ion interacting with the dipole moment of the water molecule. So I'll draw a couple of water molecules around. They're actually completely surrounding the sodium ion. So if we have our dipole moment here, we have go from the plus end to the negative end for the water molecule. And so we have the positive ion interacting with the negative end of the dipole moment of the water molecule. So these are ion dipole forces and they're fairly strong, not as strong as ion ion forces, but when you have a whole lot of water molecules surrounding the sodium atom, the interaction between the ion and all these dipoles can actually be stronger than the interaction between the sodium and the chlorine minus ions. And so that's why sodium chloride will dissolve in water.